what we're going to focus on today with Curtis Hatch, who is a senior account executive at Zoom Info, is we're going to kind of unpack his journey making President's Club last year. So he was the number two AE in December. He's got the fourth highest uh, average sales price in Zoom Info last year. So he closes some large deals. And our goal today is to kind of unpack some of the things that have been working really well for him. So Curtis, it's uh, it's good to jam with you, my friend. Yeah, man. Glad to be here. So as we start to dig in here, um, I would love to just kind of first start with, there's there's a lot of areas that we can take this, but one of the things that I don't think gets talked very much about is like how like how you structure your week. You know, there's a lot of like time blocking things that people share, but Word on the street is that you're you're pretty disciplined and very, you know, kind of systems, frameworks oriented, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. How do you think about blocking and tackling your week? So one, I think one of the biggest struggles for most AEs is time management, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, me, I've got I've got a wife and kids. And so I've got to find a way to be productive in my day while also you know, setting aside time for my family and, and my mental well-being. Um, yeah. So the way I like to go about blocking out my day to get specific things done, like one Monday morning, usually have an hour blocked out for purely admin purposes. I want to identify what opportunities are in my pipeline that have a realistic possibility of closing that week. Clearly outline like what steps are remaining. Are we with the people we need to be with? Um, are we through any you know, legal review process already, just kind of dot the I's and cross the T's of what's closable this week. And then from there, I like to kind of take a look at the rest of the month and the rest of the quarter. I try and do this every week, doesn't always work out. Um, But for those pieces, kind of the same process, although it's more so about identifying where the gaps are and what I need to know. Um, Things that I have for this week, if I'm doing my job halfway decently, I, I kind of know where we're at and where we need to go. Um, for the others, it's really what do I know, what don't I know, and how do I get what don't I know so I can you know progress the deal and and ultimately help that prospect make the best decision for their business. So opportunity reviews on Monday morning. So you're looking at the rest of the week, rest of the month, rest of the quarter, that sort of stuff. Do you have an example? What's what specifically are you kind of working through, I know you, you said that you guys were just starting to use medic and that sort of stuff, but what kind of checklist are you going through to determine, you know, what do I have? What do I need? What do I need to get? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So the first is like, do I have a clearly defined why? Do I know why they're looking at Zoom info or you know why they're looking at whatever product it is that someone's selling? Um, if I don't have the why, like, I need to press pause on everything and get that why. So if I don't have it, deal's probably not going anywhere, especially yeah. in especially in today's economy. Um, two, do I have a clear view on potential ROI? If I don't, same concept. I need to go back and figure that out. Assuming I have all those things in place, who am I working with? And are they, do they have you know budget approval? Do they have access to the budget? Are they able to move the deal across the finish line or are there other individuals that I don't know that have that information? Um, And so I need to go dig for that. And once I kind of identify, do I have the why? Do I have a path to ROI? Do I have the people? Then I need to understand what their buying process looks like and kind of how far through that process am I? So those are kind of like the four main things that I I focus on. it's like, I can't tell you how many times we've gone through the first three and then there's some big, long drawn out review process that we had no idea yeah. existed. And, you know, that deal that was this week or this month is pushed out a month or two. Yeah. So let's hit pause here. Let us know in the chat. This is what Curtis, this is what you spend your first hour of the week, Monday morning doing. Let us know in the chat. What do you spend your first hour of the week? Monday morning, first thing, let us know in the chat. What do you spend that time doing? I'm really curious what people are going to say. Kimberly says meetings, catching up with emails, crying. <laughs> Scott Jones says <is> crying. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> Hopefully, tears of joy because all that pipeline you're going to close this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nita says same. I block off two hours to zone in. 
Yeah. Okay. So coffee. There we go. I was waiting for the coffee one. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't have kids, uh, and I think a lot of the folks probably watching have kids. Like, what what time do you typically tend to get started Monday morning, and is that consistent? And like, how much how much leeway do you give yourself? That sort of thing. This is an, again something else I because I don't have kids. I think that doesn't really get talked about a lot. Is if you have a family and especially young kids, you know, how disciplined can you be around the schedule? But do you have any advice for someone that's a parent, has kids, or you know, just you know, kind of how you approach time blocking and staying consistent? All right. So do I give you the answer that my boss wants to hear if he's watching this? Or the real answer. Um, <laughs> so, so my kids, I, I, I drop them off at school every morning and that's like, that's money time for me. Like nobody's taking that time away. Um, so drop off is between eight 15 and eight 30. Um, so I'm usually back to my house with coffee in hand by nine. Um, so nine to 10 is that block time. Now, I'll sometimes leave that block free so meetings can be scheduled over it. Um, it really just kind of depends. But as a general rule, 9 to 10 is usually that admin time. Um, but it can be flexible. Got it. So I think this is – I want to focus here on those four things that you look at because it sounds like your entire week is geared around where is the – Where's the lowest hanging fruit essentially in my sales pipeline right now? What is closest to the very bottom of the funnel? And what do I need to get in order to advance these deals? So one, you said a clearly defined why. What's an example of a good versus bad clearly defined why for you? So there's a lot of different examples. Um, One could be, you know, and I don't know how familiar most of the, the viewers are with Zoom Info, but one of the whys that I try to always get to is some type of metrics driven why. So for example, if I have a business that is looking to scale their outbound approach, I need to identify what their outbound approach is today. And then in their view, what that looks like for them. Then from there, I can paint the gap or like kind of paint the picture of what that gap is and what they're looking to do ultimately get to or pivot and provide other suggestions on how to get there. But, you know, increasing website conversion, um, increasing opportunity conversion rates, uh, reducing deal cycle. Um, those are a few of the probably top ones. Got it. And how, how quantified for you should that be? So if it's increasing website conversions, is it, do, is there a specific number that you want to have? Uh, like a, here's what it is right now versus where it needs to be. Like how specific do you want that? So it really depends on if they have any type of kind of retargeting motion off their website today. Um, where I usually start with that is trying to understand how many website visitors or leads are coming through their website today. And then what their historical conversion is on those website leads. Yeah. And then we'll talk through how to gain more qualified leads through existing website traffic. If we can do that, the conversion rate doesn't even have to change, although it usually does. But that's something where we can quantify, okay, you're sitting at, I don't know, 10 10 form fills a month. You close two of those. Maybe four of them are opportunities what have you. So you have a 50% opportunity rate, a 20% close rate on those, just making numbers up. But now if we can take those leads from 10 and now maybe we can get you to 15 or 20 off that same volume on your website, conversion rates aside, now we're looking at a, you know, 20, 30, 40% increase purely off the traffic you're already seeing today. And that's a really easy kind of line to draw on just that one thing has a yeah. measurable impact on your ability to drive revenue as an organization. Yeah. I think that this checklist, by the way, for everyone watching, this is really kind of good like to look at your deals through the pipeline and the opportunities. And this helps you set the agenda for the next call. So like I have a sales call coming up. It's the second call I'm doing with this company. And this first part that clearly defined why I don't have clear metrics yet. I wasn't able to really do a, like spend much time on that in that first call. So that's going to be one of the very first things I was literally prepping for it right before this. That's the very first thing that I'm going to do. 
I'd love to hear from you in the chat. What's the biggest challenge that you have in getting, because I see reps really struggle with this. What's the biggest challenge, share it with me in the chat, that you have in getting like quantified numbers and goals from the prospect and getting something very specific? Let me know in the chat. Are prospects reluctant to share it? Do they not know? Yeah. Yeah. So let's start with the first one. What do you do, Curtis, if you're trying to do this exercise and they don't even know the numbers? It's a good question. So <laughs> if they don't know the numbers, in that instance, well, there's two things. Either they, they actually don't know or they're just not going to share it, right? I haven't established yeah. that level of trust with that person yet. Mm -hmm. If they don't actually know it, then... I try to get a better understanding of how that specific thing trickles down to them. For example, if I don't know, like be it Zoom Info, I don't know our exact conversion rates off of our website, right? But I know that some of my best leads are the leads that come through our website. So my best leads are coming via an inbound channel. So if someone's talking to me about it, great. How would like how would it impact your ability to perform? If we were able to drive more leads that are qualified through your website that ultimately get to you, what successes are you having with those leads that you know come from your website? And now, what if we can increase that by 10%? What does that mean for you? Like, how does that help you get closer to your goal? Because in that instance, they're probably an IC, maybe a manager. So then you can kind of extrapolate from there. Great. If we can do that, Here's what it means for you. Then we can pivot to, can you connect me with the person that is responsible for that or may have more insight there? And if not, is that information you can get? And now that's a follow-up item for me to check down on. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get to this. I saw some stuff in the chat too around this. The second part we're going to dig into everyone is around the multi-threading piece. So let's say that you've got an inbound lead that comes in that's an IC or manager level and they don't know the metrics because they're like, they don't own the metric. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, I want to comment. George said they won't share the smart buyers. Anyway, do you ever find that Curtis where people are unwilling to share because they feel like it will be used as a sales tactic against them? I know it's kind of different with zoom info because you're selling to marketing and sales leaders typically. I mean, so I have an opinion on it. Uh, yeah. I think it's a it's a valid concern. And where I see that come into play most frequently is when you deal with the buyer who feels like they've been taken advantage of by a seller before, which if you're a buyer, frankly, you probably have. Yep. Um, I think that's where someone's natural ability to connect with the person that they're talking to can help with that. But I think the root of it comes down to like, you need to be a genuinely curious seller and you need to convey or at least attempt to convey the fact that like, look, I'm here to help you solve a specific business need. Like we're not, we're not even talking numbers about whatever it is we're selling. Like yeah. this is all about you, what you're looking to accomplish. And like if I don't have this information, it makes it very difficult for me to point you in the right direction. And now I'm just moving through some blanket pitch that is probably what turns you off to a lot of salespeople in the first place. So like, help me help you. That's kind of the approach I try and take with it is just align with what that person needs. Yeah. And if I can do that well, they're probably going to share the information. And if I don't, I need to go back into discovery and do a little more digging around maybe things around that specific metric. Yeah. So one of the things that is interesting, I run into this sometimes where getting the stakeholders to agree on what the metric is that's that is the important one sometimes there's a that's a conversation in and of itself so with outbound for example that's common for me companies are bringing me in helping their reps land more appointments it's not always let's just get more net new meetings yeah. it could be we need more of the meetings to convert into a second meeting we need more of these meetings to convert into qualified ops uh we're like most concerned about rep attainment and quota attainment uh, getting people to agree on a metric is interesting. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's a whole kind of stage or conversation in and of itself. So 
how do I want to answer this? Um, I think if you're not quite sure what the metric is that you're tracking, you almost need to go past it to the result you're looking to get from it. So you mentioned um, you know, more qualified opportunities, right? More meetings that move on to the next step. So now we're talking about not just driving more meetings, but driving meetings that are better fits or that are qualified better on the front end. Uh, now, I guess from an outbound perspective, that's a little bit different, but there still is a major qualification piece that goes into scheduling that meeting in the first place. Um, this might be a bit controversial, but I think it also may go back to how those reps are comped. Cause like yeah. a lot of reps are comped for meeting volume. Right. And so if someone's focused on their whole paycheck is based on the volume of meetings that they're driving towards, they're not as concerned about that next meeting. So then how does leadership address that concern? And that's a whole other conversation. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's just kind of my initial thoughts that come from it. Yeah. Well, what I'm kind of getting from that too, this is where we can kind of, that we'll get to is, am I talking to the right person? And if I am talking to someone more senior, they might look at this problem a little bit differently. Sure. And that might have a different way that they measure it. Um, let's, uh, okay, let's look at the second part. So we've like, talked about, I want to have a clearly defined why, potential ROI. How do you think about ROI? What is the net benefit to the organization that they're getting from purchasing my product? And what is the desired benefit they're looking to get? ROI isn't always dollars. Um, for example, like reducing ramp time of new reps, massive ROI. You think the average rep takes six to nine months to be a net benefit to the organization? How do you take that six to nine down to four to five, three to three to four? Like yeah. that's a tangible ROI that if you can, you know, show that you can deliver that, doesn't matter what the the quote unquote dollars are that that product drives to your business. If you have a ramped AE faster, like you're going to make more money. Um, the other side of that is the dollars aspect. If I go back to that other example about, you know, website lead volume converting at a higher rate, or even utilizing your outbound activity to drive more inbound traffic, right? Now we can start talking about increases in traffic, increases in uh, conversion of that traffic. And if you can get down to like what their ASP is, now you have a very tangible number on, hey, here's where you're at today. This investment results in this potential dollar amount that's going to impact your business. But it's just I think too many people focus on the dollars. And while that's important, it's not always the thing that's going to motivate your buyer to move forward. Yeah. So how do you how do you find out with the how do you find out with the prospect what that metric is? Is it as simple as asking them? Is there some education that you provide on what other people typically measure? Like how do you get to a consensus on what that should be? I think it kind of depends on the situation. Um, if I'm working with somebody that, you know, I've had success in their industry before and I know what worked for them and, and what solution was put in place, very easy to use client voice to give an example of what this organization did to achieve similar results. They're in your space. They were looking to do the same thing. Here's how they implemented it. And here's what they're seeing from it. In others, it, it can be just a direct ask. Um, but I think it it all comes down to aligning with what the person you're talking to cares about and then trying to identify how you can address that problem or concern or whatever the item is. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm also thinking of, I don't know, a really simple question to ask is, you know, how do you guys think about the ROI on a purchase like this? Or like, or like what's the what's the desired impact from a from a purchase like this? Like yeah. ROI is kind of a canned term. I think someone yeah. in the chat is like, I don't like the acronym of ROI. I don't disagree actually. Like mm -hmm. I, I try and think of it as like what's the desired outcome or what's the impact to the business that this could have? Yeah. Because it's not always you know, ROI tied to money. 
And like, sometimes it is money. Sometimes it's not. Um, And it's just about establishing and aligning with what that desired outcome is for not only that person, but then the other stakeholders, if it's not that person, what their desired outcomes are of whatever this project or initiative is. And then just align it. Got it. So you're thinking, have we clearly defined a why? Have we looked at potential ROI or a cost of inaction? If we kind of pause there for a second, are you getting a lot of this stuff like in the first meeting? Is it multiple meetings? Like I think there's, again, one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot, especially with larger deals is, you know, running a meeting with one individual that you're talking to versus a group meeting. Yeah. And how you kind of think about that? How do you how do you think about the different types of meetings? I guess that you have throughout the sales process. So, first meeting, like I'm just trying to get as much information about anything they can share as possible. Uh, now, try, now move that into maybe the first meeting leads to a group meeting next, which ideally, especially on a larger deal, is is how that's going to go. Now I need to be able to articulate what I learned from that first meeting the outcomes that I learned that person's driving for and then check down and confirm, is that what everyone else on this call understands to be the desired outcome, understands to be the problem, or is there something that I'm missing completely and then go from there. But I think it's important to lay out what you know or what you think you know, and then let them correct you or guide you in the right direction from there. Cause one it's going to show that you were paying attention in the first conversation. You were listening to the person you're talking to. Two, that you're trying to have a specific outline of the conversation that drives to what you believe their outcomes are. And then if those are different, then it gives them the opportunity to interject with what's really important or what the thing actually is. Because that surface level information isn't always right. Or it's one person's perception of what the problem is. And now somebody else, like, actually, it's this thing. Or it's this thing and this thing. And how do we do this, right? Yeah. So basically, you're uncovering as much as you can that initial conversation. Then once it comes to a group meeting, are you putting like on a slide or something like that where it's like, hey, here's what I've uncovered or here's what I know. What do we think? And the the goal there, it sounds like, is to get some consensus on the problem that you guys are trying to fix, that the customer is trying to fix. Yeah. So I typically just verbalize it. Um, I'm not a huge slide guy, which... There's, there's that's conversation about if you should use decks or not. Um, I'm not a deck fan, but I try and have a clear, like a clearly defined outline and talking points that I'm going through. But back to discovery, like discovery happens throughout the entire cycle. It's not just one call. It's not just your first meeting with the conversation or first meeting with the, the, the first individual. But when we've transitioned to a group setting, recapping what you discovered already, let them kind of guide that. And then asking questions related to the points they bring up. Like I think discovery is ongoing through a sales cycle. It's never just this go to discovery and then move into demo and then go into the close. Like it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, no, totally. So always recapping to the, to the bigger buying group. If we go to this third part, so the, who am I working with is the third part. Um, how do you think about Lyle kind of asked a question? He said, how important is it to identify an internal champion? If we kind of step back from that question, what are the different like types of buyers that you're thinking about in terms of like, what is the checklist of people that you need in order to feel like, okay, cool. Like this is, I am talking to the right people. Yeah. So, I mean, internal champion, like is the, I think everybody wants an internal champion, you don't necessarily have to have one to get the deal done. It just makes it a hell of a lot easier. Um, but I, ideally, I want a champion, someone who's going to sell on my behalf within the organization. Um, I want to know the person that the solution is directly impacting, who's responsible for the results tied to it. Or there's probably multiple individuals that fall under that bucket. Um, and then beyond that, I want to know who can say no to this deal. Yeah. I almost care about the no more than the yes. I want to know who can say no, because that also means they can probably say yes. Um, And then I definitely want to know who's responsible for signing the agreement, even if that person isn't actually the person that is the deciding factor, if you will. How do you know? So basically, this is you want to know who the champion 
is uh, a potential blocker and then it sounds like an uh, an economic buyer if we're using like medic you know kind of terminology yep. so how do you know if someone's a champion or not what's your definition of a champion so for me if i know i have a champion they're kind of communicating with me behind the scenes they're keeping me updated on what's going on um, yeah. after the meetings have taken place they're sharing insight on hey here's what this person's going to care about uh talk about this on the next call Oftentimes that person may just be a coach. A coach is going to do a lot of that as well. But now is the champion going to actually put their neck on the line to progress the deal? Yeah. And so if that person is like willing to go get somebody and bring them to the next conversation or, you know, walk into, for, you know, example, walk into the CEO's office, be like, hey, I need this thing. Here's why. And they're doing stuff like that behind the scenes versus just, yeah, I'll send them an invite and hopefully we can get them on the next meeting and like, good luck. Yeah. So you mentioned coach. I think we should talk about what's the difference between a coach and a champion. A coach is going to tell you where you need to go. A champion is going to get you there. Yeah. So champions got influence. In other words, people yep. trust them. They can lobby on your behalf. And I think oftentimes we mistake a coach for a champion. Oh yeah, we have that person that's super helpful, and they know all the other stuff. But push comes to shove, they're not going to do the thing you need them to do. Exactly. So um, this is where I feel like a ton of people get stuck, and it's something I've been super passionate about the last you know six months or so. Um, okay, so let's say that that first conversation we have someone. Let's let's start with this situation first. Let's say that the first call that you do is with someone that is more of a coach. And it's more of an like an IC sales manager. Let me know in the chat, what percentage of your, the very first sales calls that you do with a, a new account, what percentage of those are with someone below the power line? So someone that's like a manager in IC, let me know in the chat, what percentage of your first sales calls with a new account tend to be with people below the power line? Yeah, it's kind of all over the place. It's it's very high for a lot of people. Um, for me, it's it's you know if someone comes through the contact form on a website, it's not like a VP of sales typically coming through the contact form. It's usually a sales manager, uh, sales enablement manager, that sort of stuff. So when you think of that first call, are you spending a decent amount of time in that first call, like talking about the stakeholders and doing some stakeholder mapping? Like, how do you get this information? How do you think about oh, that? so? The first thing I'm trying to do is with an IC, I feel like you have to align to their specific goals. Like how does your product make their life easier? Like they came to you in most cases because they have something that they're looking to accomplish. There's something that maybe their business isn't providing them that they need. It's not necessarily that, hey, there's this big project that we're working on and they sent me out to go get information on it. So like I need to get them excited. If I can get them excited about how this is going to change their life or their day-to-day -day process or make them better at their job, once I get that, then it's like, all right, cool. Who else do we need to involve? Like, if you're not the person that can sign this, if you will, like, who are the other individuals that have been involved in purchases similar to this? Have you ever gone through a process like this? Um, if they haven't, great. Do you know who would be responsible for that? But like, I think, it, I think the most important thing is first aligning with the person that you're talking to, regardless of role, but especially in an IC standpoint, because you need to get them excited enough to get you in front of, or at least tell you who the next person is that you need to ultimately win over. And typically it's then their sales manager. Yeah. So let's say that, okay, they, they kind of help you map it out. And, and, and let's say maybe oftentimes I find that they don't even really know. Like they throw out a couple names. Oh, it's going to need to talk to my sales manager, but they aren't able to say, oh, and our chief revenue officer, you know, that's the economic buyer and that's the person that's going to sign in. They usually talk to the CFO. Like let's, let's say they don't know any of that kind of stuff. And like, how is there, like, are you coming in like already having researched that account a bit to kind of know who to ask for? Like how much of this, I guess, is coaching? your point of contact around how it typically works because you've sold this more than sure. they have versus asking them. Yeah. I think one of the things I, I do try and get a map of potential buyers or people that I think might be the buyer before the call. 
um, you know, zoom info plug makes it fairly easy to do that, or at least get some directional information. Um, so when I get to that point, sometimes I might ask, sometimes a volunteer was like, Hey, is, is Bob still like the VP of sales? Is he somebody that would oversee this? Or does this need to go to your CEO, Jim? Um, yeah. I think before that, I also need to understand like where that person rolls up into the org. If they're a BDR, like they could roll up to sales or marketing, depending on the organization. So like, I need to understand what that channel looks like first. And from there, yeah, suggest a couple names. And oftentimes what I find is they'll either agree or like, no, it's actually this person. Great. Can you get me in touch with them? Or I'll reach out to them, you know, directly after the fact. Got it. So this will get to Adele Burroughs, your question. How do you convince the initial POC to introduce decision makers? I find they are often reluctant. If you were to get kind of into the brass tacks here, how do, how do you ask for that? How do you deal with any kind of pushback or reluctance that they might have? How do you think about that part? I think the first thing I'll ask if there's pushback is like, listen, do you think, like, do you believe in this? Like, does this make your life easier? Would you want this? If the answer is, I don't know, or I'm not sure, I need to do more discovery with that person. I'm not even at the point where I need to get to the next person. Yeah. If the answer is yes, it's like, great. You like you want this, you need this. Like We need to get to this person to get there. Like I'll do all the heavy lifting. I just need you to get me there. Oftentimes, that's where I have the most success. But again, I have to already have that person on my side. If they're not, I haven't done enough work and I need to continue working down that path until I can get there. Or the other aspect of it is I've identified that this person's never actually going to get me anywhere, but now I know who I need to go out to go after. Now I just kind of leave this person behind and and move on to the next. Um, Another, another way of doing that zoom info specifically is, is, you know, we do have a short free trial option. It's like, Hey, if I give you access to this for a couple of days, you like what you see, like, is it fair to then introduce me to this person so we can have a conversation about how this could impact not only you, but the rest of the business as a whole? Yeah. So leveraging a gift to get there, it sounds like. Um, sure. So at what point, what percentage of the time roughly do you find that the IC or the person that comes inbound is has no influence so they're not able to actually get you the introductions and they're unwilling. And then you, you go on that journey without them. How often does that happen? Probably 30 to 50% of the time. Oh, wow. It's That's a high percentage. So what, percentage. what do you do in those situations? I mean, I, I use zoom info to identify who I need to, Yeah. who else within the organization fits my buyer persona. Right. Yeah. So if that person isn't getting me anywhere, who else do I need to involve is one. The other is who else is in a similar role as this person? I already have some insight into some of the difficulties they're dealing with. If I can let me backtrack, there's a couple of ways I can go about this. I can either create internal groundswell by hitting other ICs up with, hey, Jane is dealing with this. Is that something you're dealing with as well? I'm you know, I'm not here to sell you anything, but I do have you know, I want to offer you a free trial of Zoom info. Great. Move on from Jane to Billy to Sally, so on and so forth. Get enough people there. Certain number of them are going to like what they see. One of them is likely to then give me a warm introduction to somebody else. The other aspect is I can bypass that entirely, take what I've learned in discovery, go to sales manager, director, whatever. Hey, your team's talking to me a lot about experiencing pain here. And then pivot into client voice. We do help a lot of organizations that are looking to solve X, Y, Z in your industry, here's what they've done, like worth a few minutes of your time. And then you can kind of get the best of both worlds where you're hitting the ICs, but you also have content going into your buying committee, if you will. And between the two of those, you're likely to get some traction somewhere, assuming again, you've actually identified the pain. Yeah. So with the ICs, is this LinkedIn messages? Is this emails? Are you calling people? All of the above? How are you engaging them typically? So, you know, the the title of this is, you know, how I hit without cold calling, right? So I I don't do a ton of cold calling, um, which frankly is a a weakness of mine that I'm looking to get better at. But (laughs) we may may have to talk about that offline. Um, So I, I do a lot of sequencing. 
Um, but you know, I also have an SDR that I work with and cold calling is what they do all day, every day. I know where my strengths are. I know where they aren't. I know where her strengths are. So I'll get content out and my SDR will oftentimes follow up on that content or do some of the cold calling for me. Um, that being said, if I am going to cold call, which is kind of why I don't say I cold call much because I get a I get a message in front of them first. I'll call behind messages all day, um, but I'm not the best at reaching out if I haven't sent an email previously. Yeah, gotcha. So it sounds like a big part of your sales motion then is I have to figure out like is this person going to help me? Are are they willing? Are they able to help me? If not. Who do I need to go about alone? And I'll do groundswell. I'll reach out to you know more senior people directly. And if they are willing to help you, what is ideal for you? So in that second call, who do you want in the call? And how do you set the expectation for like if you could get really specific with logistics? Are they inviting people to the call? Do you do you schedule it on the call while you have them there? Like all of these logistics. Sometimes but always a- try. Always try and get the meeting before the the next meeting scheduled before the call ends. Yeah. Like sales 101, get the next meeting before you end the call. If you don't, like your odds of actually getting that next meeting drop drastically. So what I'll typically do is I'll ask them how they would prefer we go about it. Like, hey, let's get this time blocked off now. Do you want me to send you the invite and you can invite insert names of whoever there? Or do you want to give me their information and I can give it? Or if I already have it, like, hey, we need to get these people on the call. I've got their info. Do you want me to add them to the invite? Yeah. So I try not to, at least at that point, I try not to step on that person's toes too much. I want to leave the option up to them. Then obviously, if they don't deliver, I know who I need to go get. Got it. Okay. So who am I... Working with part number three, we talked about champion, blocker, having an economic buyer, any other kind of insight or any questions, let us know in the chat around this multi-threading piece. So getting the right people involved, getting introductions where you need it. Let me know in the chat. Do we have any other questions for Curtis on that topic or any other challenges specifically that you think of as a rep that you're running into when it comes to how do we get more people involved? And an interesting stat from LinkedIn is 78% of reps are single threaded on deals. So this is a huge, huge problem. But I think Um, on the other side of that is on average, like there's anywhere from 11 to 15 decision makers on opportunity. So if you're with one, even three people, you're probably not covered in your full buying committee. There's someone else that you don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. So... Okay. So this fourth part, the buying process. So how do you talk about the, and when, I think the timing of, uh, of this is pretty important too. When do you start talking about their buying process and, and what are you looking for? So as soon as I buy it, well, it's happening throughout the conversation, whether it's the initial meeting or multiple meetings. Um, at the end of the first meeting, even if with, if I'm with an IC, I want to know if they know what their buying process is. Yeah. So like if I've got the pain, I've got alignment with that person, I'm going to at least make the ask, hey, like, do you know what happens next when you guys look to acquire sales and marketing tools? If they don't know, but we've got the next person, great. Now the process starts over. Am I aligning with that person's pain in addition to the first person's pain? Do I have a solution? Once I have that information, and I know that they, it's something they're interested in moving forward with. Same thing. Hey, great. Do you know what the buying process looks like when you guys buy tools for sales or marketing? Does it typically involve? And then again, people I already know, Bob, Sue, Jane, VP, whatever. Or is there someone else that we need to loop into the conversation that maybe we haven't spoken to yet? If I've gotten to that, like once I get to that second level, they usually have an idea of where this thing ultimately needs to go. They've probably, at least with most of the company sizes I deal with, they've probably been involved in some capacity of a, of a buying decision. Um, but the process just kind of repeats. Like every call, align with the pain, align with what we're solving, determine if they're a blocker or going to aid me in getting there, right? And then ask the question. Yeah. 
Gotcha. And in terms of knowing good versus bad, if uh, if you haven't gotten quite what you need from a buying process, what are typically some of the elements that are missing? Um, I think one of the so when when I'm trying to identify buying process, finding out who signs the contract isn't usually the hardest thing to get. And I yeah. think historically, it's an area where earlier in my career I struggled with was understanding before signature. Like, are there any other internal reviews that need to take place? Like, what part does legal play in this? Like, do we need to meet with your procurement team? Or is this something that, you know, you handle in the entirety of and it just goes to Bob for signature? Uh, yeah. So at this point, are you, when you bring this up, have you guys already established that this person like wants Zoom info? Ideally, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you get the person that, you know, asks for all the the pricing and whatnot when you haven't gotten all that information. And yeah, it's like, I would love to give you price. I just don't know enough to give you an actual price. Like I'd just be throwing a number at a wall and, and wouldn't actually know if that's the right fit for you. Um, so then I try and then pivot back into kind of what we've touched on before. What do I know? What don't I know? And how do I try and find out what I need to know before I get to that piece? Got it. We're about to do some Q&A here, uh, everyone. So if you got questions for Curtis, drop them into the Q&A. And uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. So drop into the Q&A. If you got any questions for Curtis, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you is, um, okay, so one of the things we talked about when we were doing prep was introducing new ideas to prospects. Yeah. And they're seems to be in your sales process, a big portion of this is like introducing new concepts and ideas and getting prospects to think about the problem in a different way. And I'm sure that that opens up a conversation for them to think about solving that problem in a way that they weren't thinking about before. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you think about that? Yeah. So I think in, in most cases, someone's coming to Zoom Info for a very specific or what they think the need is like zoom info provides data. I need more phone numbers, right? Mm. Yeah. You probably do need more phone numbers, but why do you need more phone numbers? Like what is in, what does your current process look like that determines you now need more phone numbers? How do you guys go about generating leads? Where do your leads come from? Right? How are you targeting those accounts? And so if I, as an example, have a, a business that is, you know, they, they've identified maybe the industries that they want to look at. Uh, they know who the contacts are within those businesses. And now they're just trying to get as much content out in front of those types of organizations as possible. Like, yeah, that's, that's a strategy. Where I'm going to take that is great. You know who you want to reach out to. Why are you reaching out to them? Like, what's the compelling reason you have that you're reaching out to this organization now? I don't know. Or could be whatever the thing is. Maybe they had a new hire. Great. That's awesome. Like, how do you determine what companies receive what messaging when? You know, and, and then that pivots into a conversation around, okay, you don't have many leads coming through your website. Um, you have a, an ideal list of who you think you should be targeting. What's that based on? Is it based on historical win, win rate or just where you think your product's a fit? So then now let's say it's based on historical or based on that's where they think their products are fit. Great. Have you ever thought about analyzing your current wins and even your current losses and knowing, okay, we have a really high win rate in these industries, yet we've been targeting these industries or we lose business all the time with these industries. So maybe we should focus on other industries, right? That's, that's like one route I might go. Another would be around the compelling event piece. How do you know when companies are actually in market for your solution? If you have 20,000 companies you could sell to and you're a team of 10, there's no way in hell you're getting compelling messaging in front of all 20,000 of those companies. You're probably going to get blocked as spam. And yeah, you have more phone numbers, you have more emails, but you're not actually getting anywhere. So like, how do you prioritize the time that your team is spending to make sure you're reaching out to the companies that have the highest likelihood to respond favorably to your message? How are you doing that today? You're not, 
here's how we can do that. Here's how your team can be more informed on who they're reaching out to and why. Because the why and the when, and timing is everything in sales, right? If you don't have a reason to nail the timing aspect, you're just kind of spraying and praying and it's not the most effective strategy. Yeah. So it sounds like you know a lot of what the the most compelling features are of Zoom Info. And you're able to like ask open-ended questions around those things to expose gaps in ways that they haven't thought about something. Yeah. You have an idea of what those things are before you talk with someone. Most of the time, yeah. Um, I think the other the other piece is too, like I do try and identify who they compete with in their space or even before yeah. the call starts. Who are some companies that I think might be competitors? Now, are they a Zoom Info customer? Great. If they are, what are they doing? What do they have with us and how are they implementing it? And now it's like, hey, you know, you're looking to take market share away from X company, right? Well, here's what they're doing currently. Here's how this works. Here's what you're doing today. Like, how do we bridge that gap? Here's the solution on how you do so. But that's different. And it's an entirely different conversation that you're now having from somebody who just came looking for phone numbers or emails. And the process can be the same across any industry. It's just like, having the interest in understanding what your company or what your prospect is actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. And, you know, you're the market expert in what you do, right? I'm the market expert with my prospect on what Zoom Info can do. So like, I genuinely feel I'm doing them a disservice if I just try and sell them the thing they came for, if they don't know about these other things and they are a really good fit for what they're trying to do. Now, does that mean they always buy that? No, they may still just buy the thing they came for. And there's a lot of reasons for it. But if I'm not doing, or if I'm doing my job properly, I'm solving the immediate need that they think they have now. And I'm educating them on what the need really could be, what the goal is that they're looking to get to, and the best way possible to get there, utilizing the product suite I have available. Yeah. Love it, dude. Let's uh, Let's get to some questions. Ashley Hogan has a question. Would love your thoughts on creating urgency. The client wants the software. You're moving towards the finish line and things slow to a crawl to close. Thoughts on speeding this up? So it all comes back to alignment with what that person's desired outcomes are. The easy answer is, and what most salespeople are going to do, and a lot of sales organizations are going to do, is... They're going to throw a discount out to try and get the deal pushed through faster, right? Like I was reading something on LinkedIn the other day, actually, where it was like, it's almost impossible for a seller to actually create urgency. And so if you're looking to get the deal done faster, yeah, you can throw a discount, but is that really the thing that's going to do it? Probably not. The more effective way to go about doing it is if you're aligned to the outcomes that they're looking to achieve, like what's the actual cost of waiting? Like if you wait three months, you know, we've established that we can, you know, again, zoom info talking, but like that we can, you know, take your opportunity level from, you know, or your, maybe your meeting level from 10 a rep to 15 a rep. And we know that that's going to yield an additional two or three opportunities per seller. And you have 20 sellers. That's like 40 to 50 opportunities per month that you're missing out on by waiting two, three months. So like, if this is the goal and this is, and this is where we're at today. Like, what does waiting actually do to hinder you in achieving what your ultimate goal is? If it's price, sure, I can work with you there. But like, what's the actual thing? I don't know. That'd be kind of my answer to that. Yeah, cost of inaction. So if if I've quantified that we can increase this by 20%, there's a value to that. And I'm missing out on that value. Yeah, and like, single, yeah every- if you're... You got a a business where you're selling, you know, 50K, 100K, million dollar deals, like waiting three months to buy a, you know, 50, 100K solution, whatever it is, has a very, has very likely prevented you from potentially millions in pipeline that you could have generated in that same time frame just by moving yep. forward. No, love it. Uh Rolando asks, what do you ask in an attempt to revive a case after a prospect promises to send you the RFP materials, then ghosts you? Depends you on who the prospect is. RFP, RFPs, Curtis? We don't do RFPs, but the, I yeah. mean, 
concept's the same, right? Uh, you know, if someone's saying they're going to get you somewhere, they're going to do something, whatever the thing is, and they don't, how do you respond to that? So it depends entirely on who the person is. If it's a CEO and they're doing that, I'm going downstream. I now need to create groundswell with the individual users that my product's impacting. If it's someone downstream, I need to go upstream and try and identify the impact that the inaction is having that that person or that would yield the result that person cares about. Uh, So if they've ghosted me, I'm obviously sending messaging, like touching on what we've talked about and why we're having this conversation and identifying, is this still a priority or not? But I'm also trying to go either upstream or downstream, depending on who the person is I'm talking to, to continue that conversation in another channel. Gotcha. There you go, Rolando. Uh, Man, well asked for Curtis in regards to this meeting's title, where the majority of your sales from warm leads inbound leads that help you guys your president's club without cold call. So if I were to go based on volume, more wins came from inbound leads. If I were to go on dollars generated, they were not inbound leads. Um, now the caveat to that is some of those, you know, my, my biggest deal last month was a referral from a former customer, Right. So I'd done my job well enough with them where they referred business to me. Um, but I had a probably 20 to 25% of the deals that I closed, which accounted for probably 50 to 60% of my revenue, were originally like a cold lead, whether that was maybe someone that we had a closed debt opportunity with previously, or I used Zoom Info to uncover companies that are looking at lead gen or you know, prospecting information or Zoom info specifically and use that to now tailor some sort of outbound messaging, which is going to be a combination of email sequencing, having my SDR chase specific contacts, and then call behinds on those sequences myself. Gotcha. So Donnie's got a couple of questions, but I thought while you're talking about SDRs, Donnie asked, what is the best way you have set uh, your SDR up for success? How do you part? How do you think about the partnership between the SDR? What does that look like? So it's a partnership. Too many AEs think that the SDR works for them, and that's just not true. Uh, uh, yeah. It's it's stupid. Um, so what I've found is the easier I can make life on my SDR, the more they're going to be willing to do for me, right? Because they, if I'm not sending them stuff to do, like they've got tons of lists that they can call through all day, right? So if I have maybe a target account list. I'm not just sending them an account like, hey, prospect into this account. It's like, hey, here are the five people within that account that I want to talk to. And here's the messaging that I want to be delivered to that person. Then they just execute on it. Um, So I try and give them as much information as possible. So all they have to do is pick up the phone, touch on the things I wanted them to touch on, and hopefully get a meeting booked, right? Um, The less they actually have to do on the legwork, the better it works out for everybody. They can push more volume on their calls. I have a better qualified opportunity when that meeting comes through. And it also then allows me to focus on other things while those calls are taking place. Is there a weekly touch point or meeting or one-on-one or anything like that that you do with your uh, SCR that you're partnered up with? Yeah, I do it bi-weekly. Uh, we have a 30-minute session bi-weekly where we review the current opportunities and pipeline, the current standing, where we need to get who yeah. I need to go after. And then we, we slack back and forth all the time. Like if I need something, I'll just like, Hey, I need this. Here's the person. Here's the message. Get this person or these people from X company. Gotcha. Uh, Donnie also asked to get a champion to put their neck on the line for you must be challenging. How do you go about achieving this? We kind of talked about this a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's aligning to what that person cares about. If you can solve the thing that person cares about, they're going to do what they need to do to make sure that things move forward. Right. Like for, for Donnie, I, I don't know. I don't know what your role is, but let's say you, know, you have, let's say I have something for you that is a game changer in your day to day. You like it frees up so much more of your time. It's going to make you more money. I'm pretty damn sure you're going to go to your boss and be like, we need this shit. <laughs> like yeah. take a call with this guy we need to have a conversation. Like, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what we need to solve. But if you can't align to that, both the need 
and also just the, the rapport building with the person, then it's really difficult. But if you can do that well, then creating that champion becomes a lot easier. Yeah. I think we got time for one more. I think it's Yitchcock Young. I'm probably mispronouncing your name. How do you help draw out the why when there are multiple people on the call? So any tips for running? We talked about it a little bit, but any tips on running group calls where you have four or five people on a call at a time? So for me personally, in most cases, the four to five or multiple people is not the first call. So it's normally one person and I've, feel like I do a halfway decent job of actually getting the why for that one individual. And so, and I kind of touched on it earlier, but it's then relaying what your understanding of that why is. And then basically just starting your discovery over with those people pending their answer to if that's right or not. Like another example of this would be, you know, I sell into sales and marketing and sales ops, marketing ops, right? Revenue ops. So there's a lot of different people. And if I have people from multiple departments, then that's a little bit different than if I have four sales stakeholders on a call. Uh, So, you know, if I started with sales director that now has me with sales VP, marketing VP, so on and so forth, then it's like, hey, here's my understanding of what is happening within this sales director's business. Here's where, how I understand where leads are coming from today. And then, you know, here's what I understand the overall need is as it stands right now for your business. What's important to you out of that? Or is there something completely different that is most important to you, CMO, or you, CRO, or whoever that person is? Like, what are you thinking about and what keeps you up at night? And then let them go for there, from there and pen, depending on the answers, dig in, get clarity. But the goal is to have a very clear vision on what you're solving or what the desired outcome is, at least for me, before I actually show them anything. Yeah. Got it. Dude, good stuff, man. We uh, we got to run. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I'm going to drop in Curtis's LinkedIn profile into the chat. I want to thank ZoomInfo for sponsoring the webinar. And uh, Curtis, dude, this is great, man. Tons of takeaways here. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a good rest of your day. We'll see you guys. Yep. Yep. Later. Thank you.